comment is that you do have a one-dimensional system, so it's so the solution is just restricted to one line, right? So um, being autonomous means what hap what happens is where you if you start at some point and you approach in the limit, you have an omega limit point. Let's say it's here, right? Then pretty much you would have to do it monot um, monotonically. See, so you cannot go back and forth, right? Because why can't you do back and forth? Solution cannot, so you cannot go through a point in both directions, right? So at every point, so, so you really have to go like this, right? Um, if you plot it versus time, because you, you're not allowed to do like this and then come back and then, because then you'd have one, one, one location here where, you know, you would violate the direction, right? The direction at one point is, is unique, so it's either going this way or this way. So you cannot go back and forth, of course, in being continuous or differentiable. So, so this cannot happen. So that's one thing, and, and, and then the next thing is you have to conclude that it's, the limit is actually an equilibrium so that f at that point is zero. So this le really levels off, right? So again, you, don't, you cannot just... I mean, you can you can say assume it's an equilibrium, or or we know it's an equilibrium. But I mean, when you make a proof, you really want to make it argued in such a way that anybody comes in and and bangs at it that that it doesn't fall apart. See what I mean? I mean, when you make an argument, you have to make sure that it's it's the dots are connected. You you don't jump to a conclusion without you know making a reason for that. So sometimes that happens uh, in your arguments. And um, anyway, I mean, it's just a way of um, learning. But um, so I kind of, I've kind of had to fill a lot of the blanks. And sometimes I just said, you know, that's not complete. It's just I don't see how you got from here to there. You know, in your in your uh, reasoning. Um, and as I said, the, 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 the best thing to, uh, to kind of see this is that, that the limit is indeed, in other words, that it doesn't, you know, uh, if you start at Y, you, you stay at Y, so it's a steady state, it's an equilibrium, is um, kind of probably the most elegant was this, that you can write this as a gradient. Which in this case is just um, you know gradient in one dimension is just derivative. So just just to write this system, I mean just this equation as a gradient system, and then basically mimic the proof that we had it for for, for gradient systems um, to conclude that you know any any omega limit that has to be an equilibrium based on basically. What is this value of of this potential function along solutions, right? So, v v prime is f, so v is just the antiderivative or minus the antiderivative, right? You know, I mean, just to give you an, give give you a concrete example here. It's, you know, if I write this x equal x minus x cubed, right? Then you can say this is the same as. Uh, gradient system for v is x4 over 4 minus x squared over 2, right? So this guy has a bunch of minimum, right? I mean, uh, critical points. How do you find the critical points? Well, is the derivative set equal to 0? So you have three critical points, and, uh, you know, it looks like this. Right. So basically, now uh, you would argue what? How would you argue that these are the only ways you can get a omega limit point? In other words, you cannot get an omega limit point 
you know, I don't know, at a one half. Why? Because a solution at uh, approaching that value one half, right, is going to have v decreasing, right? Always decreasing. Remember that's how the gradient systems are. So it's decreasing, and then at at one half, you see it's not zero, so it continues to decrease, right? So actually, the same, you know, with that that kind of funny. Um, I have this in the solution. It says that if if I start with um, the solution at so I have at t n starting at zero, I know this goes to y, right? Then the solution at t n plus a little s will well um, v along that one goes to v along the solution starting at a little s and y, right? By continuing. So, but this guy, we know that it's actually strictly less than v at y, right? So being strictly less than v and y, this being a decreasing with respect to, to the t variable, decreasing to something less than v of y, how can that happen at the same t at the same time as v of t of a t n and x not going to v of y? So that's the contradiction, sort of, right? Or that's that's what's uh, you know prohibits you from having y something that's where solution continues to decrease. Huh? But again, you can write anything you want. It's just question is, is, is there a coherent argument? Um, anyway, the second, the second solution, and again, I, I'm actually thinking of two more, and I've seen kind of attempts in your um, solutions of having two different ones, to, I mean, uh, at least one, one different approach. So, um, well, anyway, um, can I move to number two, or you want to go over the second, you know? It's a little bit like like the proofs in the book that that you have you have little details that you know either I mean you have to fill them with something with some sort of argument okay um, even in the in the proof of the Poincaré Bennigsen theorem it's um, there are places where one really needs to you know, be very, very detailed to, to make a, a coherent proof. Uh, so anyway, I mean, I, I probably kind of laid out a second type of solution. Um, so just feel free to read that. Uh, the, the fact of this problem is, is something that probably you can all you know, get a, a, a grip on. I mean, it's, right? I mean, even I think when we start talking about it, we said, you know, it just kind of makes sense to to assume that when we did the phase lines, right? We kind of said, here are the equilibria, and then in between we have arrows, right? And the arrows don't stop before an equilibrium, so it goes really towards equilibrium. So that's the limiting behavior is always towards an equilibrium. But, you know, to, to prove that that's not, you know, that takes a little bit of... So anyway, I, I thought it was an interesting problem, but I don't know about you. So. <laughs> um, okay, problem number two. Oh boy. Um, uh, 
And I've seen this in homeworks as well as uh, here, well, less here, but more in the homework, is that what is the role of a Lyapunov function? Or how do you use a Lyapunov function? You use a Lyapunov function that if you find one, then you can draw some conclusions about the equilibrium. Okay? It's not necessarily the opposite. So if you know what you need to prove, like you need to prove something is, say, asymptotically stable, because that's what you see in the picture, right? It's not always the case that you can then find a Lyapunov function, or that it must be, there must be a Lyapunov function. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm saying is some, I, I've read some proofs which said, um, oh, we see it's a... Um, Asymptotically stable equilibrium. So, this Lyapunov function, which I which I gave you, must satisfy that that thing. Okay, and um, it's it's for for general systems is not. I mean, in this case, it was of course there was a restricted uh, neighborhood of the origin. Um, but in general, is you may not find any good Lyapunov function to to help you, you know, to to help you draw some conclusions about stability, okay? So it's just it's just a nice thing to have if you have it, but it doesn't mean you always have to look for one or there exists one, okay? And then, so let me just make that... Uh, um, if you do end up with this on some neighborhood of an equilibrium point, so of course you have to exclude the equilibrium itself. So you have an isolated equilibrium and you have the Lyapunov function is decreasing on some, on some uh, Neighborhood. So, for instance, in that exercise, it was zero zero was the an was the equilibrium, right? And what was the neighborhood where this thing was strictly less than zero? I think it was this band, right? Less than one in absolute value for y. So a negative between negative one and one. Okay? Can you conclude that zero zero is, not, is asymptotically stable? And of course, the other conditions were satisfied too, so. But this was the key. Can you so what can you conclude from this computation? You make the computation and you get that it's strictly less than zero if, if y is less than one in absolute value. Conclusion is it is asymptotically stable, right? How far can you go or what is the basin of attraction for this based on this information? Circle radius one. And why circle? Why not an ellipse? Because it's the level curve for the actual Lyapunov function, right? Because the function was x squared, x squared plus y squared. So, so it is exactly the the shape of. I mean, it's the level curves of the, or level sets, right? For this function, that the question is, what's the largest level curve or level set that's included in this in this region, right? And why am I saying this? Because, well, first of all, it's not true that any point here is in the basin of attraction of this origin. Why not? Why is this point possibly not in the basin of attraction? Hmm? 
Well, you see, what is this? This point sits on a level set, right? Every point sits on the level set for the function, for, the, for this Lyapunov function, right? Which in this case is really the distance to the origin. So this statement really says that this point, when you start, you know, dynamical system starting at this point, is going to have the distance to the origin decreasing, right? But you see, it could be decreasing and escape in this region. And once it escapes, here, the radius is no longer getting to, to zero. So you just cannot conclude that this point is attractive to the origin, right? So it has to be in the level set that's totally included in that region because once I'm at this point, then I know it's going to decrease, so th then it's going to actually, that property of decreasing distance to the origin is going to decrease all around, I mean, in this whole thing. So eventually it's going to have to go to zero, and that's the Lyapunov theorem. Okay, so that's the, so you really, I mean, that's the proof of the Lyapunov theorem. Understanding the proof is really the key in actually drawing these conclusions. So simply, simply to saying this happens on a neighborhood doesn't mean the neighborhood, the entire neighborhood, is actually in the basin of attraction. And if you've done, and you should have done the picture actually to see what is actually happening, you know, the face portrait, you would have seen what? You would have seen, I believe, some sort of a like a periodic solution. that actually has some parts which are outside of this band, right? So, you see like, this Lyapunov function tells you nothing about these points, but that these points are in the basin of attraction here, right? But, um, as it turns out that, that, that they are, because everything inside of the uh, periodic solution is actually now attracted to the origin. Okay. Can we? So, how would you argue now that the basin of attraction? If you know there is a periodic solution like this, and you know this is asymptotically stable, can you conclude that what the basin of attraction is for this particular example? Beyond that, sorry? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, can you conclude that the basin of attraction is everything inside of the periodic solution? So, everything in the periodic solution gets attracted to the origin. But you don't. So you see, it's limited. The Apollon method is really limited. What's the... Yeah. You can, yeah. It's like you have a tool that you can use if it's a, if it's there. But if it's not there, you just we I mean, can try hard and get a Lyapunov function that it will do a better job than the previous one, right? But you see, that's it's not a it's like a trial and error. It's not a good systematic way, right? So, so what would be one argument to say that since when I have a, a, a periodic solution like this, and an equilibrium, and an, an, an unique equilibrium which is asymptotically stable, that everything inside of the periodic solution, so that region inside of the periodic solution, gets attracted to the origin. Hence, it's basin of attraction. Mm-hmm. 
Jupiter there has the tangent F field at the boundary. Mm -hmm. And then somehow I want to say anything inside the boundary then spirals continuously inward. Right. So the question is why? I mean, you don't have to. You can just use the PV theorem, and that's that's the right the right way to go. But you don't have to look into how it's actually proved. What's what's the PV theorem saying? So, so again, this is you know this is beyond this exam, of course. But uh, if the question is what is the basin of attraction for this system, for you know, for for the origin, for this dynamical system. Well, again, the key is is to um, identify or or show that there is a unique periodic solution. Non-constant non periodic solution. That, that uh, circles the origin. So it keeps the origin inside, right? All right, and that's non-trivial okay I mean in fact chapter I think chapter 12 talks about how you can actually show this but it has to use really really kind of very specific properties for instance um, one property could be the um, uh, study of the null clients of the system okay so again, I mean, if you read chapter 12, it's actually all about showing that there is uh, an unique, an unique periodic solution, right? But let's say we, we have, you know, we, we, we know this. So we've proved that or something. And also know that 0, 0 is the only equilibrium, right? Then the poincare bendixson says... Anything that's inside, right? So, so pick it's called gamma to be this this uh, solution. Okay, pick some pick an initial condition inside of this. I'm going to call it int from the interior of this. Okay. Then the omega limit set can consist of what? So it either contains the equilibrium point, right? Or if not, it's a periodic solution. Now, to be a periodic solution, can, can this gamma be, be the omega limit set? Why? It's the alpha limit set, right? So the same thing works for alpha limit set. It's either the origin or it's uh, the equilibrium or the periodic solution, right? But you cannot have... Why can't it be the omega limit set? It has to be the time going to negative infinity. Well, you know is that that's a sink in the neighborhood. And X could be outside the neighborhood of the origin. Correct. But then, then if, if this were the omega limit set, then what would be the alpha limit set? It would have to be smaller inside, right? And we don't have any way of uh, going, you know, of, of going to an omega or alpha limit set that's periodic solution, right? Besides this one, right? Now, why can the alpha limit set be the, the origin? Well, because the origin is asymptotically stable, so you cannot go away from it, right? So that's kind of the, 
the reason why this thing has to be and actually you can say the, the, the alpha limit set so as t goes to infinity, right? Omega limit set as t go to plus infinity and alpha limit set as t goes to negative infinity. This thing is basically gamma as a set, right? So there you go. So, so basically it means that any point in the interior is the is in the basin of attraction and nothing else, right? Okay? So asking for the whole basin of attraction is 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 a difficult it's a global sort of behavior, right? Asking for uh, something about the, the um, or some size, something about the basin of attraction using Lyapunov function is some is you may prob you probably don't get the whole thing, but you get at least something, right? You get more than what you would get from linearization. Linearization really just says there is some small neighborhood where you know things. Once you're there, then you go towards the origin, but. Okay, so that's the that's the the tool of Lyapunov function is is not perfect. It's very imperfect actually, if there is such a word. Um, so again, it's 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 more in the argument that you make is um, that you have to be basing on 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 and recognizing that you're not. You're not using a tool that is very definitive. Okay. Uh, let's see, number three. Number three was relatively easy. The only problem, the only thing that, and I haven't really uh, asked that, so I didn't expect uh, to um, to get it. You know. An answer, but I was I was hoping that um, at least somebody writes the word conjugacy between the two systems, and um, well, it hasn't happened, but that's okay. Um, everybody said oh, it's almost identical. <laughs> so uh, what that means is almost can. It can leave room for a lot of interpretation. Um, so, you see, that's one thing that a lot of people said. Oh, that's ob that's obvious. That you know, because one is uh, you know, you have a full nonlinear system, right? Or in this case, it's a second order equation, but you write it as a system. And then you decide, well, you know, this. You know, this system is just too complicated. Let me approximate it, right? So you approximate it. But, you know, when I gave you this problem, I didn't even, as I said, I didn't put three factorial. I put just three. So it, so it's not, it's not that these things are, you know, that's the Taylor expansion. But even if it is, so even if you put three factorial, so you do have the sign is approximately equal to this. Question is, you know, when you look at the face border of this and you look at the face border of this, what are the similarities? And and you, you you've you've seen, I mean, just by plotting them, you've seen that they are very similar in the neighborhood of the origin. That's where you perform the linearization. Okay, but beyond that, it's really not. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that one is the Taylor expansion of the other or is the Taylor approximation of the other. I don't think. Right? But it turns out that they are um, conjugate. Okay? They are conjugate because so they are similar in that sense that they are conjugate. You can imagine a map that takes one faceport into the other. Right? but not globally. 
that's the that's the whole thing. It's it's not globally because uh, what what did we say? A conjugacy map has to carry has to carry an equilibrium point into an equilibrium point, right? So since you only have three here, you know, globally this system is not this phase project is not conjugate to this one, but it is conjugate to a subset, right? So I don't know, this was something like going this way and this was going like this way, right? So what is the region where these things are conjugate? Or what is a region where these things are conjugate? You know, there's more equilibria here. Around the origin, I think you can go all the way beyond this point, right? But you cannot go, let's see. Well, certainly the inverse, because conjugacy means inverse, right? So if you, if you start here and you imagine a map that takes this picture into this picture, I mean, that's not a Hamiltonian, it's just a conjugate, conjugacy map, so a little h, for instance. Right? Then you know that you have to kind of restrict before you reach the fifth, okay? The, the, these are the equilibria, right? But you can take this region and actually map it to that region in a one-to-one onto -one fashion, okay? Because everything is the same, like these periodic solutions match these periodic solutions, right? So it's just, a, it's an interesting kind of connection, but you see, this also holds true if it's not three factorial. So even if they're not really, then it's it's also holding. I mean, well, I guess you can rescale things. So probably. Anyway, it, w it would have been much more interesting to look at, you know, ask find a you know conjugacy or find a reason why when you make the when you make an approximation, you you really get conjugate even if it's nonlinear systems. And that's a difficult. I mean, that's a so I didn't really ask that, but um, I didn't ask. I didn't get it, so that's okay. Um, okay. Now, one thing that's uh, relevant to this, or one one thing why this uh, problem is um, of interest is. And that's something that keeps people, I mean, frustrates people, is that, okay, where did this, where did this example came from, you know, come from? Um, well, it really comes from, from higher dimensional analogs, you know. And um, so, so let me just say one word here is, is if I have in 2D, for instance, uh, if I have a um, differential system, but second order. So, so x is x1, x2, right? And I have some uh, f is now s right. You can well, let me put it like this so you can. Then, what is what is this supposed to mean? Even, 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 uh, even like this. Okay, let's let's do it this way. So, this is a totally different animal than compared with what we've done so far. Right? What have we done so far? We've done about systems, first order systems that are nonlinear, right, in the plane, but it's first order in time. Well, now the question is, what about if it's second order in time? Okay. Well, obviously this really says x, um, I don't know, maybe we should use x and y instead of x1, x2. So, well, no, 
I want to stick with X1 next time. So this system really it looks like this. It looks like uh, a function of x1, x2, and x2 double prime, excuse me, equals g uh, f2 of x1, x2. So we haven't really dealt with this type of systems because what what's the dimension of this? If you are to write them as a, as a first order systems like we, we we've dealt with four, right? So it's so this is equivalent to x1 um, x2 and x2 prime is y2, y2 prime it's not double prime here it's just prime, right? equals f2 of x1, x2 so you see this is a four dimensional dynamical system Okay, so we always refer to a dynamical system as being governed by a first order system, right? So this is a four, four dimensional one, right? So it's, you know, the face portrait is four dimensional, it's, things can wrap around, you know, it's very complicated, right? Still, this kind of systems co uh, appear from the, you know, from just classical uh, mechanics, right? Because what is that saying? That's saying that I have, a, I have an object moving in the x1, x2 plane, right, with some force. Right? But this time is, is a force acting on, on the object and it's not, it's not a prescribed velocity as it is in, uh, for, for that, right, in the face portrait. So, so the object could be, I don't know, could be going um, like an ellipse, right? It's the acceleration of that motion that is prescribed. Okay. So th really, the trajectory of this in the in the x1, x2 plane would be sort of really a projection of what happens in the four dimensions. Okay. So anyway. Um, there is one special class of of, um, of such systems. So in general, this covers lots, all kind of motions. Uh, but there is one class called the conservative um, equations. So our equations where this forcing, this force, is actually a conservative force. What's a conservative force? There's nothing political here. It's well, that's exactly what you know. Like in Calc three, we said we talked about if the force. So that's a that's a vector field, right? It's a direction field. If it's a gradient of a scalar field, of a scalar function, excuse me, called a potential, right? Then this system, the second order system, has some nice property. And that was the, that, that was the uh, exercise, really, to show that this system is Hamiltonian. Okay, so this system is Hamiltonian. I mean, okay, it's a system; it's not an equation, but um, you could say it's a, it's a vector equation, right? So again, compare this with. So in other words, so compare these two. So one is the. Um, second order derivative, so that's, that would be motion in a gra gradient field, right? By a force, force that's uh, the gradient of a, of a scalar, and 
compare this with a uh, gradient system. Okay, so that's a gradient system. That's a not a gradient system. This is not a gradient system. In other words, there is no. When you write it as a dynamical system, there's no um, potential where you can write, you know, well, there's no potential where, um, how should I say it, the, the solution curves don't go, you know, uh, orthogonal to the, to the level set of, those, of, of that potential, okay? Instead, it's Hamiltonian, so this is kind of one of those two special classes, right? So this is, so let me make a comparison here. So in this, remember the level curves of this uh, were sort of acting as, or the solutions were actually going normal to the level curves of V, right? So this is V equals constant. Okay? Here it's not, in this picture, it's not by any means the same way. Um, in, in contrast, this is Hamiltonian. And what does it mean Hamiltonian? Basically it says that uh, system it says that you can find a solution, uh, a Hamiltonian function depending on x1, x2, y1, and y2, or actually sometimes it's listed as x1, y1, x2, y2. So we talked about these Hamiltonian systems for two variables, right? What would be for four variables? It's very similar. It's it's the partial. I mean, it's the derivative of x one with respect to time is the partial of h with respect to I think y one and y one prime is minus partial of h with respect to x one. Okay, and same for x two. Okay. So these are two very different, even though the right-hand side is the same, the order in which, you know, the first derivative versus the second derivative makes the whole difference. And there's no way to uh, really plot this in four dimensions, right? But um, one thing that's happening with the Hamiltonian systems in two or four or any dimension is that the Hamiltonian along solutions h of x1 of t, y1 of t, x2 of t, y2 of t is actually preserved, conserved, right? So if you use the chain rule to take the derivative, then you're going to see what? You're going to see cancellations because it's going to be partial of h with respect to x1, x1 prime, right? Was partial of h with respect to y1 times y1 prime. So this, those two terms are going to cancel, and then the other two terms are also going to, going to cancel. Okay. So after the chain rule, it's going to be basically zero. So it means h is conserved quantity. Okay. And for this conservative system, there is actually even an explicit. It's very similar to what you uh, get there. Is basically h of x uh, one y one x two y two is just one half y one square plus one half y two square uh, plus v of x1, y1, uh, v of x1, x2, okay? 
So you can just imagine taking the partial of um, h with respect of y1. That's just y1, right? So that's x1 prime is y1. That's the first the first equation in the system. h with respect to x1 is partial of v with respect to x1. So with a minus, that's the first component of the gradient. Okay. So you can using this Hamiltonian actually, uh, you can write that four-dimensional dynamical system in this form. Okay. So conclusion is this this quantity is actually conserved. Okay. So again, the conclusion is, for a, for a conservative system, let's go, excuse me, grad of v of x, then the Hamiltonian, if you write it in terms of, remember y1 is x1 prime, y2 is x2 prime, so this is really the length of x prime of t squared plus v of x of t. Okay? This is constant with respect to time, in time. And if you have a, if you imagine, you know, the motion of a point in this conservative field, you know, the x prime is the length of x prime square is the, it's called a, what kind of Well, it's just the, the, the speed squared, right? It's the length of the speed squared. Right? X is the position, so X prime is the velocity, right? The length squared is the speed squared, right? Of course, you'd like to have a, a mass here, but if you have, to have a mass here, you have to have a mass here. So if you say mass is 1, so that's mass times velocity, um, speed squared over 2, that's called the kinetic energy, right? And v at that position would be called it would be called the potential energy of that solution of the system. Okay, so then h is the total energy. Is the sum of the two. Okay, so there is this I mean big advantage of, of writing of recognizing when things are Hamiltonian um, because it kind of gives you. Um, this conserved quantity for free. It's automatic, right? So, so is, that, is that all it means to be a conservative system? Uh, second order. Yeah, so if it's second order, so you have a motion. If you have a motion, Newtonian, no, no, mass times acceleration equals force. Um, if that's the system you're describing, uh, yeah, then then it's called conservative system. I mean, of course, there are other systems for which there are conserved quantities, but those we don't call conservative systems unless they are really coming from gradients. So, again, the chapter thirteen talks about motion in conservative fields or in central force fields or in both um, for uh, that, that comes up in, uh, in celestial mechanics so I'm hoping whoever's gonna pick on that uh, topic to um, you know to get to get a little bit more in depth right so that's the I mean again the chapters are really go into uh, the details of you know what happens for instance, if it's not just conservative, but it's also uh, central force field, meaning that forces are always 
pointing towards one direction. Just like gravitational force, right? When you have a heavy object, you know, um, you place it in the origin, so everything else is the direction is pointing towards that point, right? It's called central force field. So the the more the more properties you have on this, the more interesting you know conclusions can can get. In fact, you know, in two dimensions, if it's conservative and if it's central force field, then the solutions end up being um, periodic. Okay, that's totally not obvious. Why is it not obvious? You see, we're not we're not talking about x prime equals that. Okay. We're talking about uh, x double prime, meaning that we have this Hamiltonian which is conserved, but this, I mean, remember, if, if you're in two dimensions and you have a function conserved, means you are restricted on the level set of that function, and a function of two variables, the level set is a curve, right? So you are bound to one curve. So the conclusion that you have um, periodic solutions, or you have homoclinic, or something, is very, is very. There's nothing to say, right? Because you're on a curve, you cannot go in any other direction but left or right, right? And if you don't encounter any equilibrium point along that level curve, it means you keep going, right? That's basically exercise one. If you think about it, right? Um, so you get a periodic solution, you come back in finite time. But here, is, you cannot say that. Why can't you say this? Because what's the level set? That's a level surface. It's a three-dimensional surface in R4. Okay? And all you're saying is, I start at some point, so what guarantees me that I'm not going to wander you know, around that three-dimensional surface? I, I, can, I can do that without coming back to the same point. I have lots of freedom, right? So it's a one curve on a three-dimensional surface. Okay, so you cannot draw that conclusion. So it's not an immediate conclusion. In, ha in fact, it doesn't happen this way for Hamiltonian systems. That um, just by knowing the fact that you are on a level surface of the Hamiltonian, that you have periodic solutions. Okay. So that's the reason it takes a whole chapter to. Actually, it took a lot, a lot of uh, work to um, beyond this thing to conclude that you have that the orbits of the planets, you know, in a simplified planetary model, that it's they're periodic and they're elliptical, and you know, there's more stuff to it. Okay, but just the periodicity is kind of not not clear from that. Okay. Anyway. Uh, I, I told you this, so now when you look back on your on your problem, that you say, you know, this really is, um, you know, one-dimensional version of it, or well, second-order uh, equation, and in this case, you have because you have a Hamiltonian and it's only two variables, so the level curves are just are just curves. The face portrait you can see, and everything's there. Okay. Um, problem number three, four. Sorry. Any questions? I don't know. Okay. For number four, I was probably the most. Um, critical about. Uh, a lot of the solutions. Okay, everybody was happy with A. There was no no issue there. But when it get to, when it got to prove that a system is not a gradient system, ah, um, I wasn't happy with most of the solutions. I, okay, and why why wasn't I happy? Why can't you just? Um, Follow that pattern that works when it is a gradient system, and you have to show it is a gradient system. It doesn't work when it's when and it's not a gradient system to show that it's not a gradient system. Hmm? 
course, the, to, to, to be a gradient system, you have to have this, right? So does there such V exist? And if I say it doesn't exist, how do you show it doesn't exist? You see, it's not as easy as just, I mean, as, as just saying, oh, let's integrate this. Let's assume it exists, right? So I'm going to integrate this. And then what? Then integrate this. And it looks like the V don't match. Well, why can't you do that? It's a very, it's a very subtle thing. So, I, again, I'm not sure it's. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't really uh, write down on your, on your solutions. If you did it that way, which, which a lot of you did. Hmm? What's? Why is it not acceptable to, to draw the conclusion? Well, v cannot exist because if it were to exist, I would integrate that first one, second one, and the two don't really match. Hmm? See, we're, we're dealing with. I mean, this is this is the most standard classical example of of a system for which the you know the what do we say the this relation partial of y with respect to f with respect to y is partial of g with respect to x. So the curl is zero, right? But the Green's theorem doesn't really tell you that that f and g come from a from a from a from a potential. Remember when you when you integrate the first equation with respect to f to x, okay? You have to integrate it along something, right? Along, so what do you have to integrate along? You have to along, along a curve. You have to integrate along. You have to say it's integral from some point to some point, right? And you see, you just simply cannot integrate along this because it's not defined there, right? So you have to, for instance, integrate along any line. If you integrate with respect to x, like you try to do, right? Then it has to be along a line that's actually uh, not zero, right? Uh, uh, y is not zero, right? Okay, and that's fine. So what I'm saying is, you can always do this on on regions on on simply connected regions that do not contain the origin. So in this region, that system is conserve is a, is a gradient. Why? So there is a you can find a, a a v so that in this region you can find a v satisfying that defined in a region in a region like this. Why? Because this relation is holds true, right? And the the region is simply connected. That was enough to conclude there is a v, right? Well, so I'm kind of putting them so it's like along the x-axis and along the y-axis. So now, now, now take a region like this. On this region, there is such a v, right? Actually, on every region that doesn't contain the origin, there is such a v, right? What happens though is you can actually have the same v here. Then, then the v kind of extends here, here. Here and then when it gets back to the you know a round circle, you don't have a match. Okay. If any of you had complex variables, you, you probably have seen this there a lot. But if not, you know that's um, 
It's the same phenomenon. Right? So when you go around a singularity like this, you know, things are fine as in each sort of patch, but you just cannot make a, a V work for the whole for the whole domain. Okay? So that's sort of why I why, why I'm objecting that you know integral with respect to x, integral with respect to y, since they don't match. Because every time you integrate with respect to x, you have to be in some region like this, right? So you're in different regions. You're comparing things that don't really... The fact that they're not equal to each other, it doesn't mean that overall it doesn't happen. Of course, what's the, what's the argument? Probably the easiest argument for this system, though. For this problem, number four. It's not a gradient system, for instance, because... And you, you've drawn the picture. You drew the picture, and also there was another thing. You know, I said proof by picture is not a, a proof. You just have to, of course, get inspired by the picture. And the picture really was, you know, concentric circles. So why this cannot be a gradient system? Because... Because... Because you have a periodic solution. The periodic solution, the non constant periodic solution, is not um, compatible with. A system be gra being gradient. Okay? Because along solutions, the V has to decrease and has to decrease at the fastest rate. So you cannot just come back to the same place unless. Anyway, so it's, we, we've, di we've done that. Um, yeah. Now in part C, uh, most of you actually did the same thing, and I was okay with it. Why? So in part C, it says, show that it is Hamiltonian. And indeed, you have... The divergence, or this, you know, this expression does indeed equal to zero, but the domain, the whole domain, is not simply connected. So that's not, you know, enough, right? But you did anyway. So you you took the right. What was the you integrate with respect to y this? And then, um, I don't know if you integrate with respect to x or you just differentiate it then or something like that. And you end up with h. So you're going to say I have double standards because how come, how come I, I criticize the exact same for b and I'm not criticizing the same for c? Well, I am criticizing this for c too, but because you came up with this function, and most of you verified that this actually satisfy that, then it's okay. So why is this okay here? The method is not really okay. But coming up with a function who's, who sat, which satisfies that, that condi those conditions is the definition of something being Hamiltonian, right? So you mean that was correct by accident? Pretty much. I mean, the, in other words, this was not a proof. Okay, the proof would, would have been. I mean, the, the proof would have been. Well, okay, I try this. Oh, it just happened that it, I got something. Now I make sure this satisfies back, right? Because sometimes you you introduce extraneous extraneous solutions, and also that this is defined on the whole domain. Okay, which is. Okay, so that's the key. That this function is defined on the whole, around, all around the equilibrium point. <clears throat> anyway, this was a class, sort of a typical example of those kind of situations. The last thing um, was number five. Um, uh, 
And the reason why I gave number five is, and I think one of your homework for Wednesday is kind of the same, is, you know, it's okay to write a system explicitly, like x, you know, x prime, you know, y prime, and blah, 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 lots of stuff, right? But sometimes it's actually better to kind of think of it as some, and just think about what is what are these terms meaning, you know? So, so writing in this form, I think it's kind of, it's it's basically sends the message that, you know, you're looking at this lambda as a parameter, right? So, so without this term, what you have is really just a linear, you know, spiraling in thing, right? Or I don't know, depending on how alpha was, but. It's a, it's, we know what this system looks like, right? The question is now, if we perturb, or we add this, imagine alpha lambda is a small number, right? Think about this as an added term in the right-hand side, okay? So when you write this term, now you kind of, now you, of course you write it through, you write down the, all the, all the, both equations, but you always have to think of those two terms as being, having each, its own uh, uh, contribution to the to the system, right? So this system is really, as I said, it's pushing things towards the origin. This one, depending on how alpha is, you see, it's either pushing to the origin or pushing away from the origin, right? In a right, this is in direction of x. Of course, with magnitude of x squared, so the farther it is, the bigger the force is. Okay. All right, so this thing, um, and I was just asking for, you know, bifurcation and all that. So uh, it's kind of an interesting bifurcation, and I haven't seen anybody do a bifurcation diagram, which I was really looking after, and I should have said that in the statement. But right, because remember, every time we say, you know, show the bifurcation, you know, we, we really say uh, represent it somehow, right? So bifurcation diagram is is really desired. So so the one I made here is, well, should be, um, um, actually, no, doesn't look right. It doesn't look right. Okay? Why, why it doesn't look right? So pretty much everybody uh, figured out that the origin is a is a asymptotically stable equilibrium no matter what, right? So this is stable for lambda negative, and this is stable for lambda positive, right? Because linearization, well, or actually Lyapunov function is telling you that, right? The only difference when lambda is negative and lambda is positive is that. Lambda negative, everything gets attracted to the origin, right? When lambda is positive, only something that is inside of a circle, okay? And now take a look. So that's 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 a mistake there. Um, but nobody. <laughs> so, um, what's the radius of that circle that bounds the basin of attraction for lambda positive? See, it's lambda in the denominator, right? So it means for small lambda, this is a big, right? So the, the actual should be, bifurcation diagram should be this, right? And so it's different because, of course, these periodic solutions are all unstable, right? So it is a bifurcation. Uh, I would not call it uh, hop bifurcation anymore. Hop bifurcation means when you have an, equ uh, an equilibrium that kind of starts from stable to unstable, and a and a stable periodic solution emerges, or the up the other way around. Right. So this is this is not a hop, but it is a bifurcation because this periodic solutions uh, pop up. And of course, for lambda equals zero, there was some. For alpha equals zero, that was um, a different, like a vertical. Um.
So uh, coming back to the final exam question, um, you know, I do have, huh? Can you vote? I don't have a, a real problem except when I, okay, if, if it will be a take home, I really want it to be, I mean, when I ask for a proof, I want a proof, not a opinion, you know, it's like, uh, so, so you really have to uh, be, uh, just because you have more time, that, that I want it to be, so I'm going to be more, <laughs> more strict as, as far as accepting or not accepting a certain argument. Um, so, but let's think about this and, and uh, vote on Wednesday, I guess. Um, also, any quick question about the homework for Wednesday? Yeah. I'm the one about the ring. Yeah. It uses the phrase, uh, let's see if I can find it here, the flow preserves area. So right. What does that mean? Uh, let's see, did you have to it's use that? Nine, page 233. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, you know what? Let me point you to um, Oh, wait, wait. Okay, it's in chapter 14. Um, the computation is on page 309. So, um, volume preserving flows. Basically, what it says, that if you have a Hamiltonian system, well, if you have a, if you have a system, a dynamical system, right? And you say this is at time zero, and you follow each solution. Uh, and then you plot the uh, kind of all the, the the set of all points corresponding to solutions starting inside of this region, right? At at a, at a certain time t positive, then the area of that region is the same as the area of this region. Okay, so. So it's like if I call V of T, and the area is just nothing but the uh, double integral of um, 1 with respect to area of D of T. Agree with that? So this is D of T. Okay? And this is D of 0. All right. So what is happening is that you have the derivative of v. The question is, how can you write this as, you know, how can you differentiate this? Well, the, the point is you have to take this, change the variables using the flow. So this is the same as at uh, the double integral of d of 0 times uh, of what? Of Jacobian, basically. What's the Jacobian of this transformation? So that's phi of t. And the Jacobian turns out to be uh, the same as the divergence of the field. Okay? So. I'm sorry, that is not true. The, the derivative of it is. So, bottom line is that, that the derivative of the volume is basically the, um, um, the integral of the divergence of the, f of the field. And if you have a divergence free, so if, the, if it's a Hamiltonian system, right? Remember, divergence is a, uh, equal zero. Partial of f with respect to x plus partial of g with respect to y. If this is zero, this means that v is conserved. Okay. So I hope this is a Hamiltonian system, or is it not? Because if it's not, okay. If it's not, then probably skip part b. But anyway, that's the property of of 
flow preservation and okay so just I guess just skip part B and we'll talk about it on Wednesday but but in all these problems you have to use uh, the pretty much the Poincare Bendixson theorem right and um, some sort of argument that goes from uh, point A to point B so make that uh, effort uh, let's say to, to be as complete as possible okay because that's what I'm really going to look at uh, on the exam as well is making it uh, and, uh, you know we can talk about the solutions on um, on Wednesday of these problems um, let's see so I guess we should get going I just wanted to say if you're a grad student you really want to uh, maybe make an appointment with me this week and um, so we can we can kind of um, you know clarify what what part of your project you know can be presented and, and how and so forth okay um, so later this week I'll well I'm available the whole week so just uh, let's let's set up an appointment and um, uh, we will not do, I mean, chapters 11, 12, and 13 will basically be the presentation. So um, we'll, I'll consider those, those two, those chapters as being covered next week because of the, uh, through the presentations. Um, and I, after that, I think that's pretty much it, right? So I'll, on Wednesday, I'll try to uh, talk a little bit about this uh, chaotic behavior in chapter 14, but it won't be, um, you know, uh, much because um, anyway it's a whole course basically that, that we have to go, uh, cover but um, um, other than that I think that would be sort of the um, layout of the, of the next two weeks and um, any, you know, if you, any, any uh, suggestions or something besides the final exam uh, let me know okay and if you're not if you're not graduate student, you should you still are supposed to come on next week. I mean that's not um, exclusive for graduate students.